Today on Books, Music, <coughs> and News Review, we'll be discussing a great book by Molly Hem Hemingway and Carrie Severino entitled Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation, and the Future of the Supreme Court. Now, this is an interesting book because it's one of the few, there is one other notable book written from this perspective, but this is basically the only book that we've seen on the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings and the trial by press and the multi-million dollar smear campaign funded to oppose Kavanaugh's nomination and to blacken his reputation and force him not only to withdraw from withdraw from uh, this battle, but also to resign from his seat on the D.C. Circuit Court. This is the only book on this subject that actually presents the issues in a fair, objective, and I wouldn't say nonpartisan, but um, it presents these, the, these issues in a way in a truthful way, in contrast to all of the other books being written about the Kavanaugh debacle engineered by the Democrats, the Democratic Party, and the people uh, funding opposition to Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, w one of the most notorious it was written by two New York Times reporters, one of them, Robin Pogrebin, and even before it was released, there were stories about a misreporting and distortion of facts and how these two reporters had hid crucial details and exculpatory evidence in order to sell this very, this very lurid, salacious book. And they weren't even successful in that the sales of this book were minimal. It was embarrassing for a group, uh, for, for two New York Times reporters to author this book about one of the most controversial judicial nominations of the past two decades. Uh, to only sell a few thousand books it was an illustration, I think, of how the public had come to realize that this concerted effort, this campaign to, to libel and slander Brett Kavanaugh's character, how it, uh, it was built on falsehoods. Uh, falsehoods. There was, no, there was n really no justification for the attacks on Kavanaugh's reputation and for inventing these these salacious allegations. Now, the authors, one of the authors, as I said, is uh, Carrie Severino, and she's the head of the Judicial Crisis Network. This was an organization founded in 2005 in order to expedite the approval of judicial nominations for George W. Bush, but they've also been very active in other judicial campaigns, like the campaign to prevent Merrick Garland from sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court to get the 2020 can Democratic candidates to release a list of names. There have been left-wing counterparts to the JCN who've compiled a list of names that a presumptive Democratic nominee and future president would nominate to, to uh, fill seats, vacant seats on the Supreme Court. But like most of the other other left-wing democratic associated organizations related to judicial picks they've they're they're clouded in secrecy Donald Trump was very forthright in releasing the names of potential supreme court nominees people like Brett Kavanaugh Neil Gorsuch who was added to the list after the initial list was, was released during the campaign, but Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Amy Comey Barrett, who these same organizations uh, 
the, the same organizations released smears against her character, including Senator Dianne Feinstein, the sitting uh, minority member or on the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. These were these were the names that were released and subjected to these these attacks. And something that the book reveals, and this was something reported on in by the media prior to Brett Kavanaugh Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation in 2012, when he he, he was um, or uh, 2011 rather, uh, when 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 his name was being being mooted as a potential Supreme Court justice, that was when this allegation by his main accuser was lodged in the context of a a therapy session. And the authors delve into that issue at length. The idea that this therapy session had any tangible connection to an encounter she alleged she had with Brett Kavanaugh as a teenager they really, they really explain in excruciating detail how this isn't possible and how this is, this is simply something that, that couldn't have happened. But her allegations were what the Democrats' hopes for sinking Brett Kavanaugh's not nomination hinged upon. She was the only, she was the last resort after the Democrats had tried a, an array of attacks to try to sink his nomination to force him to withdraw. They realized none of it was successful and that he, there was going to be a really uneventful confirmation where Kavanaugh would be approved by the majority in the Republican Senate, much like Neil Gorsuch was. And they realized that in order to, to stop this, they needed to, to find something that would destroy his character. And there's even, there's even admissions by some of the main actors in the campaign against Brett Kavanaugh that they were looking for something like this. One of the interesting parts of this book is the way the authors delve into the, the, the professional history and the associations of people like Deborah Katz, the lawyer for Brett Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh's main accuser. And it's interesting to note that she's a partisan political attorney deeply connected to the web of democratic organizations and liberal activist groups within K Street, within Capitol Hill, and the Democratic Party. The Kavanaugh's accuser, accuser didn't seek the advice of an attorney who represented uh, domestic violence victims or or assault victims. She didn't. She she consciously sought an attorney that was associated with Democratic politicians, uh, some of whom would be scrutinizing her accusations, and the collaboration between. Uh, Deborah Katz and some of the o other organizations seeking to thwart Brett Kavanaugh's nomination is something that the media spent very little time scrutinizing. And that's another, that's another noteworthy aspect of this nomination. And the authors delve into this, the fact that every spurious accusation against Brett Kavanaugh was breathlessly repeated but they never bothered to scrutinize any of them, regardless of how ridiculous they were. Uh, by the end of the nomination process, and this is something, this is a reason why I think people should read this book because it gives, it reminds them of the absurdity and the surreal quality to the Kavanaugh nomination hearings. Something that you never would have seen in the nomination of any. Uh, Democratic judicial pick. Uh, leftists and liberals try to try to stoke outrage over the fact that Merrick Garland wasn't seated on the Supreme Court, as if there's an entitlement to be be given uh, a nomination hearing. But the worst that you could say about Mitch McConnell and the Republican Senate is that they didn't give him a nomination hearing and that they didn't confirm him. Whereas 
Brett Kavanaugh's entire character was assassinated on the most flimsy and spurious charges, which were invented specifically to sabotage his nomination. They weren't things that existed prior to the campaign to torpedo his nomination. These were things designed explicitly to do that, much like in the Clarence Thomas hearings. And Kerry Severino worked for Clarence Thomas. That was one of the, that was the main impetus, uh, the fact that she was a clerk for Car Clarence Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas was the main impetus for her founding the Judicial Crisis Network and getting involved in this issue. And the comparisons drawn between the Thomas hearings and the Kavanaugh hearings by the media are usually are, uh, are used primarily to attack the Republican Senate, the race and the sex of the Republican senators who helped to shepherd these judicial nominees through. Whereas I think a better, a be better point of comparison is how both nominees had spurious charges brought against them at the very last minute with no, no real verification. In, in the case of um, uh, Brett Kavanaugh's accuser, she, all of the contemporaneous witnesses to this incident denied that, not only denied that it occurred, but they denied that they were in that house and that they were with, with her when this happened. So she said that there were three other people, although her story fluctuated on the number of people, but she, she, at, at the very last, she claimed that there were three other people who could confirm her account because they were there. Of course, Brett Kavanaugh himself, uh, his friend Mark Judge, and another woman who was her close friend. But even her close friend was rejected the idea that she was with her at, on this date. And in fact, she couldn't place the date even within a few years or the house or explain how she traveled to this, this event. And yet the media presented her as someone of unimpeachable character and a reliable witness, even though there was nothing about her story that was reliable and she couldn't, she couldn't accurately describe what had ha happened or how it had happened or, or the aftermath. And one of the interesting, another interesting aspect of this book is the, the, the fact that they talk about some of the third parties, some of the friends and associates of Brett Kavanaugh and his accuser. And one of them, the woman that she was relying on to, uh, to verify her story, went through incredible turmoil at, but because she was pressured by friends of uh, his accuser and also by her own acquaintances, <clears throat> they exerted pressure on her to basically lie, to make the statement that she did recall this event and that her Brett Kavanaugh's accuser was telling the truth. And she said she didn't have any memory of this event and she wasn't going to lie, even though she initially said that she believed his accuser, even in that statement, she affirmed that she didn't know anything about the party that was being described or had no recollection of that. So even her most reliable witnesses couldn't affirm anything that she said, the main points of her accusation. And the fact that she had to undergo not only this pressure by a, a machine intent on destroying Brett Kavanaugh's reputation and sinking his nomination, but she had to go through this as she was dealing with uh, addictions and chronic problems that had plagued her throughout her life because of a, a physical accident. And it just sh shows how little these people and these organizations cared about the welfare, the, the welfare of the people they were trying to use as pawns in this chess game. Just like uh, Brett Kavanaugh's friend, Mark Judge, who had been recovering from cancer, he was, he was subjected to 
vilification by the media who was looking for evidence that Brett Kavanaugh and his friends were these heinous, just wayward teenage boys, despite all evidence to the contrary, the fact that uh, Brett Kavanaugh was reputed to have an upstanding character. And they mentioned in the book these hundreds of women who attested to his good character and the fact that they couldn't conceive of him ever doing anything like uh, like the actions of which he, he'd been accused. But the media, again, the media distorted and and siphoned all of this through their own partisan lens and the goal of thwarting Brett Kavanaugh and primarily Donald Trump. And the fact that Kavanaugh was a Donald Trump net nominee raised the stakes. The, also, the fact that he was replacing a swing vote. Neil Gorsuch, of course, replaced Antonin Scalia, who was a, a proud originalist and a conservative. So there wasn't as much energy invested into stopping his nomination. But Kavanaugh replaced a notorious swing vote, Anthony Kennedy, who served as a mentor of sorts and even recommended him to President Trump. <clears throat> this fact re resulted in a campaign of unprecedented vilification and character assassination, which is what is recounted in, in this book, Justice on Trial. And it's just a good reminder of all of the bizarre things that happened during that confirmation fight. But not only that, they actually go and reveal new details which hadn't been disclosed by talking to uh, the parties firsthand and interviewing them. Of course, they weren't able to interview uh, Brett Kavanaugh's accuser, but they were able to interview all of the other people who were intimately involved in shepherding his nomination through and, and people who had been friends with Kavanaugh for, for decades. And it, I think the, one of the main takeaways from this book is how dangerous it is to invest your trust and your faith in the news media because they've repeatedly distorted these consequential events these, uh, and, and, and assassinated the character of upstanding individuals just in order to succeed in a partisan battle, a battle between differing ideologies. So they're more concerned with opposing tr Trump and thwarting Trump and maintaining their stranglehold on the Supreme Court than they are in presenting events in a factual, accurate, and to the extent possible, objective manner despite the fact that they, that they still ha have a pretense of objectivity, they routinely go out of their way to put the, their thumbs on the scales and to intervene in news events, to create news rather than to report news. And aligning themselves with uh, democratic attorneys and organizations and corrupt officials they were nearly able to su succeed in, in torpedoing Brett Kavanaugh's nomination. And another aspect of this book that's interesting is that the two, the two authors <clears throat> go into the, the Democrat counterpart to the Judicial Crisis Network and the Federalist Society, which helped President Trump and previous Republican presidents come up with a suitable list of Supreme, of names for Supreme Court vacancies. They, they describe the left-wing counterpart to this, which exceeds anything that you see on the conservative side of the aisle and spends tens of millions of dollars trying to, trying to maintain an artificial majority in the Federal Judiciary Committee, uh, Federal J Judiciary, rather, uh, the circuit courts, the appellate courts, um, and the Supreme Court, they spend millions not only attacking 
judicial nominees, but also distorting distorting <clears throat> what the job of a of a federal judge is in order to to advance their cause. And this has precedence going back to the Reagan administration. And the the authors discussed this, uh, explored the, the, this subject, the Bork nomination, how the nominate this the unsuccessful nomination of Robert Bork served as the precedent for all future Republican nominated judges. And this is one of the reasons that it's so uh, one of the reasons, and a lot of conservatives complain about the fact that Republican nominated judges very often fall into the orbit of Washington, D.C., the kind of liberal consensus there, because originalist judges, people who take a, a, a textualist interpretation of the Constitution, aren't allowed to be confirmed. They're just not allowed to prob- publicly proclaim their views. And that was the case with Robert Bork, who was honest and forthright in how he interpreted the Constitution. And as a result, he was subjected to smears by people like Teddy Ken- Kennedy and Joe Biden, one of whom had committed mans- the, the equivalent of manslaughter several decades before, and the other who was forced to withdraw from the presidential race that same year because of plagiarism accusations. And the same thing happened with Brett Kavanaugh in the Judiciary Committee. He was being subjected to lies by people like uh, Senator Blooming, Blumenthal, who had committed a uh, basically a, a stolen va- valor. He had pretended to be a, a v- part of a uh, Vietnam War unit that uh, he really wasn't and lied about his participation in the Vietnam War and the extent of his involvement as a veteran. And these were the people being charged with overseeing Brett Kavanaugh's nomination. But even more, uh, but what's even more egregious is that these people were allowed to come out even before they had inquired and investigated Brett Kavanaugh's views to say that they were going to sabotage his nomination. They came out publicly and said they were going to sabotage him and refused to even consider voting for him. And the authors point point out how hypocritical this is for people who were dead set on voting against him from the time of his nomination to then demand thousands of pages of documents and he had accumulated a long paper trail working for George W. Bush, working for independent counsel Ken Starr during the, the, the mid-90s, and also as a federal judge. He probably had a, a, more, a more prolific paper trail than almost any recent uh, Supreme Court nominee, certainly more than the, the, the previous nominee, uh, Neil Gorsuch. But these Democrats were insistent on voting against him and yet demanded that he provide all of this material. And the the authors raised this question, what what would be the point of Senator Grassley, the the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, cooperating with them and expediting all of their requests? What's the point of that if they're simply going to come to the same conclusion that they had already arrived at before the hearings began? And... It's very uh, – the book itself is, is, is worth reading for those of you who forgot what occurred during the nominal cap, uh, nomination. So even though it, it, it was less than a year ago, <clears throat> it was earlier uh, this summer, it's still worth reminding yourself of how – insane some of the some of the events were leading up to this nomination and and following this nomination and the fact that uh the authors also point this out that that these people who tried to sabotage the nomination didn't relent once he was confirmed in fact they proudly proclaimed that they were going to continue investigating that they uh gerald nadler was one of the democratic congressmen who said that he would try to impeach brett kavanaugh even though the makeup of the Senate makes that impossible at, at the moment. 
but these people never relented even after they had been defeated they saw the saw it as a partial victory and claimed that their that they had boosted democrat turnout in the elections and something else uh, Molly Hemingway and Carrie Severino point out is that this is a bit of ex post facto rationalization because they looked at the polls and they demonstrated how almost all of these vulnerable Democratic senators who represented bellwether swing states and were up for re-election election lost, with the exception of John Tester in Montana. He was the only one who managed to barely squeak by and was reelected. So um, if there, there is strong evidence that the Kavanaugh nomination had an impact, but it impacted the Republican Party positively because a lot of people realized that <clears throat> entrusting Democrats with power would lead to more of these uh, show trials, more of these uh, witch trials. And it's, it's just something that they, they couldn't countenance, which was one of the reasons the Republicans gained seats in the U.S. Senate. And they also, they also describe the concerted effort by, con by conservative uh, ju uh, supporters of Brett Kavanaugh to support, um, support him. And one of the groups they focus on is the Concerned Women for America. And this is a group that has, has been pivotal in, in, in some of these fights, especially since the failed nomination of Robert Bork. And they describe it as uh, a group with its half million members, 35 state directors, 400 chapters, and 42 college cha chapters had made the confirmation of Supreme Court justices a priority in its grassroots political work. Uh, the conservative CWA was not a rubber stamp for Republican nominees, however, having come out against Harriet Myers. Uh, CWA's prompt endorsement was enormously helpful for Kavanaugh's case. Uh, and they go on to describe their their how pivotal they were among some other groups in allaying Republican fears. And one of the something else that's really interesting about this book is is how they describe some of the some of the senators and their responses and contrast them. And a good example is the the response of Susan Collins, which really was a profile and courage to use a uh, cliche in contrast to Lisa Murkowski who was really a profile and coward cowardice now Lisa Murkowski is an example of nepotism gone gone bad she's the daughter of Frank Murkowski who was senator for Alaska for however many decades and even though she admitted that she could not find any evidence that Brett Kavanaugh had committed any of these crimes that he was alleged to have committed, she was still voting against him simply out of partisan spite. She didn't say it in so many words, but basically that's what she said. Whereas Susan Collins stood up, and despite the fact that she would expose herself to criticism and hatred, even anthrax, phony anthrax threats and threats to her life and threats to the lives of her staffers, some of whom resigned, Despite all of this, she stood firm and gave a, a really eloquent speech in the, the well of the Senate explaining how this process of hatred and division really needed to stop and we needed to really examine people's character. And based on that ju judgment, she came to the conclusion that Brett Kavanaugh should be confirmed. So the this contrast of a between a profile in courage and a profile in cowardice i think is one of the best parts of this book but also the the the, the main takeaway i think should be not to trust the media and their characterization of these things and not to invest your faith in their portrayal of anyone particularly people who 
hold values that are antithetical to theirs. So anyway, uh, th this is just a recommendation for justice on trial. Uh, if you have a chance, you should definitely get it uh, to get a, a clear view on the Kavanaugh nomination.